Welcome to another edition of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and uh, executives tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards. Jason Todd is my co-host. Jason, great to have you back on the show, my friend. How are you? Uh, happy to be here. Looking forward to this discussion, talking about leadership. Uh, and the, our, our guest here, if I'm, if I'm seeing this right, has a podcast as well mm -hmm. and uh, about leadership. And so I'm excited to hear what he has to say in his forthcoming book, uh, Hidden Trade Ca Tradecraft of Elite Managers, Unveiling Second Nature Skills for Remarkable Performance. And one of the things I also like about this is that this book is in his mind and going to paper as we speak. So we, uh, I think we're, we're hitting this individual, uh, at that point that a lot of authors find themselves at where they've got all of these ideas, they've got skills, they've got experience, then how do we get that into paper and then, uh, bring that to the world. So let's welcome Paul. And, and of course, uh, how do we, we, we also have to, you know, fair warning here on the emissary authors podcast, you're about to hear this expertise delivered in a master Scottish accent, right? We're going to, we've got a, we're, we've got a real life Scotsman on the show today. So I'm just making fun of him ahead of time, bringing him in. Paul Morton, welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm not coming. That's it. You've, you've, you've thrown me off. I am delighted to be here talking to you both today. Apologies. Thank you so much for inviting And thanks for coming. And, um, you know, I, uh, you, you answered this question up front to, to us, but I really want the audience to hear because this book that you're coming out with hidden tradecraft of elite managers, you point to a moment, uh, just as a father raising kids and recognizing, seeing the, the, the road ahead for them, seeing that, uh, one day they're going to be adults in the workforce. And they're going to be dealing with, uh, you know, colleagues and managers and decisions and daily routines. And, uh, you wanted to play a role in influencing how they thought about that. So, so take us back a little bit. Let's start there. Like you, you, you mentioned the impetus with, for this was a conversation with your daughter. So tell us, help us pick up the trail from there. Well, she was about 10, when she came basically smart cookie angling for more pocket money. And I was in the middle of doing something business -y. And she came, daddy, when can he get a job? And I was thinking, ah, oh, well, 13 is the law. You're not allowed to work until you're 15 in the UK. Oh no. And this crashing realization fell on my head, which is at some point, as with everything, the child grows up, goes out and does their own thing and makes their own mistakes and meets their own friends. And it's, it's wonderful to watch it happen. It's not so wonderful when you actually think it through when it comes to real life. Yeah. Wonderful when they head off to the scouts or their swimming clubs and they see all these little conversations happening. Not so much when you think about, they're going to go out, she's going to go out and date for a start. Can't be doing that. No dating. Well, no. <laughs> um, well, these are the difficult things. And it's when she goes out and goes to work, and she will. She's going to have a boss, as she will, as I did, as we all did. And I worked first in that dodgy French restaurant in my hometown, washing pot. And the boss there was a tyrant, a shooter. And in between then and now I've hired bosses, as I'm sure we all have, been everything from the range of petty tyrants to completely horizontal, laissez-faire pot smokers all the way back to tin pot little Hitlers and everything in between. Mm. And she's going to have to deal with it. And she's going to have to deal with it because most people are something like 92%, depending on which statistic you want to read that's been made up in the moment, 92% Harvard Business Review of managers have never had any support or any training in their professional managing. And mm -hmm. I thought, might need to do something. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, what occurred to me as you were saying that is that, um, particularly with, uh, with daughters. Now I don't have daughters, I have sons, but, uh, you know, particularly with daughters and with children in general, uh, as adults, one of our, as parents, one of our fears is, are they going to run off and, uh, pair up with the wrong type of person? Um, because once you, once you marry, right, you're talking about a lifetime with that, yeah. but 
all of a sudden it, it clicked for me, like, wait a minute, it's the same as true for the workforce. You know, you're talking about 40 hours of your week, every single week, mm. um, you know, with, with, with maybe, well, here in the States, two weeks for vacation there in the UK, you might get a bit more, but for the, you're spending a, a huge, significant portion of your life around those people. And you're forming relationships with them, whether you really want to or not, they could be destructive, they could be positive, but either way, you cannot avoid forming relationships with those people. And I love that you're thinking forward about that and saying there, I think it's time we paid a little bit more due diligence to this upfront than we normally do. Yeah. I mean, you spend more time at work than you do with your family, right? We do. Mm. Things I can hope for from my child, my children, I have a son who's uh, two years younger than my daughter. Uh, the number one thing is that they marry well. They marry well. Best thing I ever did was marry well. And everything else stemmed from that. Yeah. Everything else comes from that so the solid foundation. And it's when you look at both, you look at life and leadership, you look at leadership and sales, you look at, you look at business and life in general, there's this integration that we have of everything realistically when you, when you you consider where all of these words and all of these ideas we have come from. They're all about relationships and communication and encouragement or discouragement. They're about fear. They're about love. There is this continuum that we follow through in life and it's how we respond to other people. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily how we feel, but how we respond to other people's behaviors and activities that define in part how we progress through life, whether it's lightly and easily and gently and gracefully or with, with, with difficulty, with crampons and pickaxes, trying to mount the north face of the Aya when we could be going for a walk in Central Park. Yes. Yeah. I remember a book uh, a number of years ago called Don't Bring It to Work, which mm -hmm. sort of merges these two ideas that you're talking about, that the premise of which was the first team you were ever part of was the team of your family. And whatever role you played in your family is likely the role that you begin to play in every team. And so if you're the, uh, you know, the funny guy, the jokester, uh, at home, you're probably the jokester at work. If you're the overbearing, you know, gotta, gotta be heard, gotta do things at home, you probably bring that to work. And it was unpacking and I, it was unpacking the, the framework, which is instilled in us at a very young age in that first team. And then how we just simply carry that forward into our future teams at work. And I think it, I think it dovetails with your concept of not training managers. If, if nothing, if, if no other alternative is trained, uh, into people for people, uh, then whatever characteristics they developed at, at a younger age, they just bring into the workplace. So whatever dysfunctions really in that first team existed now simply carry forward because no one trained them any differently. Uh, how do you, how do you see this idea of training and management? Uh, how do you see that dovetailing with what you're talking about, which is how do you, you know, raising kids? It doesn't, it doesn't dovetail at all. And even vaguely. No, it's exactly the same for it's exactly the same. How you are is how you are. How you live is how you live. Who you are is who you are. Bring your whole self to work. Okay. Try and not bring your whole self to work. What are you going to do? Limp and leave a leg at home? What? If you, do you know, did you have advent calendars in the US? You have little calendars yeah. and you open your little door and there's a chocolate behind it or a picture of a scene oh, or something yeah, like yeah. that. Right? Okay. Paint one on your body. And when I'm going to work, I open up doors one, seven, 15, 22 and 25. I go to church, I open up doors one, seven, 54, 33, 30. When I go home, I open up different doors. It's not me. It's just, I open different doors at different times when I present myself in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the concept I think of preparing people, uh, this is why I was, I was, if you're listening in the podcast, you could have seen me smiling. Um, when you were talking about bringing training, developing your children for, and, and in the context of leadership, that's exactly, I think, maybe that's the title of book number two, hmm. the, the hidden trade craft of leap yeah. because fundamentally it's the same set of problems. It's the same set of challenges. It's leading yourself. It's understanding yourself and your position in the family, in your position in the universe, the position 
with relationship to other people and how, who you are and how you are. And then it's understanding your, this relationship that you have with others and it's moving the concept of self out of the center of your universe and replacing it with the concept of the other and that knowing that it's not all about you, but you're moving everything to be, it's, it's actually all about them. Mm -hmm. And when you start to do that, what you start to realize is that, yes, I'm important. Yes, I am, I am me. I have to love me as an individual and I also have to look after me as an individual, but, and I can't do anything for anybody else unless I've done that. But it's all about them. And that leads you neatly onto the concept of servant leadership, or rather the service of life. And this journey we have through life, this is kind of a bit philosophical, philosophical for our I was, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, we don't, we don't, we don't, don't do get philosophy, philosophy on the emissary authors. Plot. If anybody's been listening, they know the joke. But anyway, please continue. The, no, the, 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 you're moving from this, this centricity of self towards service in life and the journey of life is in service of others. And if you are not in service of others, then who are you in service of yourself? You selfish son of a, what are you all about? Why are you here? What are you for? If it's not to do your best for the world, for the people around you and the movement of self out of center and others into center turns you from being a vessel into being a conduit. Mm. I really like this, uh, because it, it continues on from, I think was something we were discussing before the broadcast where you, you're talking about, you know, your children are starting to, to cook meal and you had a carbonara the other day, and then you're going to have, uh, I think a tuna melt, uh, by children, made by children, you know, 10 years old ish. Mm. And I, and I, I remember a fond memory. Uh, of my own when my kids were about that 10 ish time frame, and we went camping for a summer and on that trip, we said, well, each one of you every week is going to make a meal once a week while we're gone and you get to choose the meal, but you get, you get to, yeah, you have to make it. And that changed the framework. And I think maybe I, I didn't, I was cognizant of it at the time, but I'm more cognizant of it now, now that my kids are like twenties. Um, that I, as their parent, am not their servant, I'm their parent. And, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not your servant to make, to make sure that every meal gets on the table. I'm here to raise you into a person who can make meals for yourself and for other people, because otherwise you're, otherwise you're, you're a bit handicapped, you know, as an adult. And if that framework is not just instilled in that child at a young age that I, I need to take ownership now of making the meal, shopping for the meal, understanding prices, uh, understanding effort, understanding, cleaning up, understanding, giving, and, you know, and hoping that somebody enjoys the meal I make If that's not instilled at a young age. How does that affect then a manager when they go to work and they think, well, who's here to serve me? Who's gonna, who's gonna, you know, get all these things in order for me so that my day goes off well. Instead of just, instead of being able to take the ownership, uh, in one cell and understand I'm here to, I'm here to, uh, look out for maybe to see ahead for my employees and for the organization and figure out what that employee need and what that organization need for their future is what I'm thinking. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on instilling at a young age and how that translates into uh, into managers. I want to hit a hundred thousand. If I can hit a hundred thousand people, my maths in the back of an envelope tells me that I will have fighting chance that one of the people that my daughter ends up working for, or my son ends up working for in their first job, will have either been trained by one of those people, have met one of those people, or be one of those people. Are these people necessarily bad managers before I get to them? No. Uh, do they know nothing about how people behave, work, interact, and are motivated or restricted in their behaviors and their activities? 
No. Have they been badly raised as adults? No, not necessarily. The reason I call it the hidden trade craft was a couple of reasons. It is hidden trade craft because it's not obvious and it's, I call it the unveiling because it's right there. All you need to do is pull the curtain behind you, twitch the curtain to one side and it's, oh, of course that's what it is. Mm. Right, that's, that's how it's made. You pull the curtain to one side and there's a wee man there pulling the strings. Oh yeah, of course, of course. It was a Wizard of Oz, he's pulling a string. Of course it works. Obvious as soon as you see it. It's hidden because it's right there in front of you. It's deceptively simple. Mm. It is hidden in plain sight. It is hidden also because when you look at a, an elite performer in anything, they need whatever it is they're doing look incredibly simple. Yeah. Almost elegant, spare, sparse, tight, taut. Right? Full simple. I had a wall built and a bricklayer came around and he must have been 70 if he was a day. He had a team of people doing all the stuff and it, except when it came to the curve. When it came to the curve, he sat himself down in a little pad. The son came along and gave him this little pad. He sat himself down and he was there and he just got into this low and he was just placing no strings, yeah. no marks, no nothing. And he just laid this beautiful line of bricks, just a beautiful curve. And it made it look so simple because he's been doing it every day for 50 years. Yeah. Probably 60 years because he was an old school. He probably started when he was 12 or 13 with Warren, right? So when you start and you discover that these fundamentals of leadership are the same as the fundamentals of life, are the same as the fundamentals of being a good human, all it takes, I think, it's for somebody like me to come along and say, look, that is the same as this. Do it like that. Here's a framework. If you want to give somebody feedback, number one, don't call it feedback. Call it an observation. Nobody likes getting feedback because they've had crap feedback forever. I want to give you some feedback. Oh, God, here we go. All right. Okay. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. If I make an observation, what? An observation. I've observed some. This is what, you can't argue with that. And I observed it. And this is the impact of what I observed. I know, really? Is that the impact of what you observed in my behavior? Totally. And then they ask you, you help me understand what's wrong. All of a sudden, you've taken a fundamental parenting skill or a human life interaction skill, whacked it in a little box of frameworks, put some psychologically clean language around it, and made it useful. Mm. Twitched the curtain to one side, made it eminently simple, visible, obvious, practical, powerful, meaningful, and you've turned dirt simple question into a lever for growth. So the individual of whom you are asking Hope you're posting this question to you, posing the question to them. Instead of saying, oh, no, I don't want feedback, becomes desperate for it, become hungry for it. They want to grow. Yeah. They want to be made aware because you've done it in such a way that you've let them come with an answer. No, I watched you do that and it was terrible. Don't do that again. Yes, dad. You see, as you plug yourself back into your iPod and put the music up loud. Yeah. Son, when you play your music that loud, the impact is, I can't speak to your sister next door and we're trying to work in our Spanish homework. It's not that we don't think it's fair. What do you think? Can I put my headphones on instead? Yeah. He comes with a solution. The thing, I mean, the, the leadership thing, the parenting thing, the human thing is we don't know what the hell. We make this stuff up every day. That's part of the problem, actually. You don't know what we're doing. The person you're talking to typically does know what they're doing. And come with the answer. Your kids are smarter than you think. They, you have a problem with what they're doing. Tell them what the problem is. Tell them the impact you see of that problem. And say, well, presupposes a, a positivity on their part, presupposes a positive intent, but I think you have to work from positive intent. 
But as long as you got that as a front niche, let them go. So when you work with managers in organizations, I, I, it's my experience at least that, uh, you know, consultants that come in and talk about leadership management, uh, there's a bit of resistance to them. Full of it. Yeah. Right. There's a bit of resistance from the managers because the manager's like, oh no, you know, I don't want to grow. I don't want to be called out for my deficiencies. Uh, and you know, can I, you know, if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And sometimes managers think eh, that it's fine. We've been operating in this system and, uh, it's, it's well, it's good enough. So what do you, what's been your experience with resistant or how you can use some of these tools to overcome that resistance? The resistance comes from fear. There are two emotions in my opinion, there's fear and there's love and there's everything else that shades of gray in between. And fear counts for probably 80% of our, if not more, of our reaction to things. And in some cases of our actions towards others. The best I think most people think of is I should hurt more, right? It was what used to be called the silver rule. We started off ages and ages ago. We started off with the, um, the eye for the eye, right? In fact, you had, you had the. When might is right, really, that's where you start. I've got the might, I'm right, through you. Then you had eye for an eye. Then we had, no, I'm not, I'm not going to hurt you because I don't want to be hurt. And then we had a certain man a couple of thousand years ago come along and said, I mean, actually, lean in, do the things to the other people that they would want done. And if you listen very carefully and you read the scripture quite carefully, it's not quite treat the other person as you want to be treated. It treat the other person as they would want. Yeah. Cause there's no point in me treating you like a middle-aged Scotland, even though you could be the fun voice, right? I should treat you the way that you should be treated. So this moving, when you're talking about resistance and fear, it's fear of change. But if you can get somebody to recognize that their fear of change is, is hindering them and their growth and that they're focused on their fear and that they're lack of attention to the people around them is hindering them and their business in moving forward. It's quite a powerful motivator for somebody just to go, okay. Yeah. And you can tell them something as simple as I just said there, that, that the observation feedback thing, or the, how to hold a decent one-to-one. -one. You ever had a one-to-one -one with your manager a long time ago? We were rubbish, weren't we? You know, this little thing, there's a way of doing it that makes it really easy. There's a way of having difficult feedback. There's a way, there's a way, there's a way. And it's just, it's just stuff. It's light. It's easy. It's simple. Painless. You don't need to learn that a little bit more easily. Okay. You can dangle little fruit all the way along the journey. And you pluck them off. These are all low hanging fruit. None of this stuff is hard. I'm not talking about a Harvard MBA. Most of the stuff of that. Is, is far too theoretical. It's not useful. It's not the clues in the names. Practical. I, I work with a practical leadership academy. That's the idea. It's practical. How do you actually do it? What makes sense in the moment now? It's going to, put, move, it's going to move the needle, pull the lever, start the train, boil your kettle, whatever the, 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 the term you want to use. What's that going to be? And if you can show somebody the immediate value, the value in the moment, that I think is a powerful way of overcoming fear, but it is resistance. It is resistance to change, but then equally things that don't change die. Yeah. And one of the things that comes to my mind is that there's a difference between treating an individual as though they've done something wrong, mm -hmm. perhaps a manager, you come in as a consultant, leadership management consultant, you know, treating the manager as though they've done something wrong. It needs to be corrected rather than uh, a position of continual improvement that, you know, on the scale of leadership, we have some, we have, we have ways that we can improve this so that over time, weeks, months, years, decades, perhaps, then it can become, it can become elegant. Like you talk about with the, with the bricklayer where there, you don't have to have the rope to guide you, you know what you're doing and there's an artistry to it. And, but I find that that's it it does begin with an idea of, or a, a mindset of continual improvement and then patience, I think in the journey to allow that improvement to take hold and experiment with it, to refine 
uh, I think is the word that's coming to my mind. I, patience is one of the, one of the key traits mm. of any human. Mm. We, we all, we all try to run before we can walk. We all want to fly before we can run. We want to, we want it now. I had to teach myself patience. I plant fruit trees. And when you plant a fruit tree in, then you wait five years. Mm. Are you? You wait five years before you get a darn penny. And then the thing you get is one plum. And like, really? That's it? I get one plum. And then the next year is a plum. We said, like, okay, we're having plum soup for dinner. Mm-hmm. Plum surprise. What's the surprise? There's no plum. Have enough plum. So patience is a big thing. It's a big, big part of that. Yeah. Um, getting people to understand and respecting the fact that they didn't just trip up one day and build a 10 million pound business. They didn't trip up one day accidentally and become a, an executive in an organization. It wasn't a mistake. They haven't failed their way forward. Well, actually some people do. They haven't accidentally got to where they've gone to. They have skills. They have jobs, you know, they've got some skills. So my, my approach is always that you know this stuff already. All I'm doing is putting it in a pretty box and feeding it to you one piece at a time in an order that makes sense, in a language that makes sense, that helps you then make sense of it and patient, putting it into practice, seeing the results and wanting more. Because it's not you actually we care about. Leadership development, manager development, not about the leaders and the managers. Will work for him, my little girl. Yeah. And my little girl will go into a company as the youngest, most inexperienced employee there. And guess who she's going to have as a manager? Hopefully, one of my guys or girls. But realistically, she's going to have one of the most inexperienced junior managers there. And that is going to be her first impression of manager. Mm. She's going to look at this person like I did and say, gosh, they got a nice suit or whatever it is the equivalent is these days on Zoom. They're senior looking sounding 26 year old whereas i'm only a 21 year old gosh they must know what they're talking about not and respect them and listen to them yeah so how do we put that these people in a position where they are actually to get the best chance of success well that area i was uh this takes me back to being in the wearing the the uniform in the military which I did. And I actually had a conversation one time with my direct superior. We were both wearing sergeant stripes. We were both NCOs. And, uh, he turned to me one day and he said, you know, being an NCO is a lot like being a parent. And that's all he said. He didn't elaborate. I don't think he had the, he had the, the verbal panache to elaborate. He just turned to me and said, being an NCO is a lot like being a parent. And it was right after we'd watched our soldiers walk off to do something we told them to do. And we fully expected them to screw it up. Um, but I've, I've, that stuck with me for a long time because I realized when I, years later, when I did have children of my own, uh, it required what I learned on the job in that role. Hmm. And it required that understanding that, um, I'm not, I'm not here to lord it over these people, even though I have, you know, fairly autocratic power and I can command them to do pretty much anything I want to, as long as it's legal and, uh, and they will unquestioningly obey it. And, um, but I remembered another thing that I did when I rose to that rank of sergeant, I was like, where do we even get the word sergeant from? You know, who came up with this rank? What, what's the, and you know, it's, it's actually a derivative of a French word that means servant. Sergent, I guess is what you would say. Right. And, uh, so I took that with me and I've, I've never forgotten this because you mentioned Paul, the, the example of, um, leveraging the strengths of the people around you. I was, I, I was a fish out of water. I had chosen a military job which had nothing to do with my skill set. It was trucking, very blue collar, salt of the earth, get your hands dirty, wrench it, turn wrenches, change tires, fire up a diesel truck, run, you know, go down the road, all that kind of thing. And I, here I am this wordsmith and, you know, 
lofty ideas and all that. But um, these guys, most of them were blue collar guys from the American South and they were way smarter things than I was. They were much better at fixing things and getting things moving and figuring out, you know, uh, alternative solutions when the, the prescribed solution didn't work. They were farm boys, a lot of them. And I was in rank over them. And I could tell if I try to be the expert know-it-all here, it's going to flop big time. So, uh, one day there was some technical thing that had to be done. And I turned to them and I said, what do you think we should do? And one of them stepped forward and said, uh, Sergeant, I think, I, I think I can, I think we can fix this. And I said, okay, you're in charge, go do it. And they went away and they came back a few hours later and, uh, they said, we got it done. And I said, let me come take a look. And I, I took a look at it and I'm like, this looks good to me. You think this will, you think this will work? He said, absolutely. And, um, one of the, the, the one who had expressed the, had taken the leadership there, pulled me aside and he said, you know, I, I really appreciate that you trusted us to do that. And, uh, you know, you're not like the other NCOs. They just bark orders at you and, and, and lord it over you. And I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm not really good at this job. So I'm going to use the strengths of the people around me as opposed to using my own. Yeah. Now I didn't know in full disclosure, I didn't always get, get it right that way in terms of leading them. It does. Plenty of times I lost my temper and yelled and shouldn't have and all that. But that particular time, uh, it was just like they, that it cemented this bond of trust and they knew that I would rely on them and activate them as leaders. And it's funny to hear you sort of articulate that all in one go here with the interview. So it's a core part, I think of leadership management, parenting, and a lot of the younger leaders, managers, they're not parent. And I'm not saying you have to be a parent to be a good leader or manager, but by golly gosh, it helps. Mm -hmm. Especially if you've got somebody who is or was who can guide you. Yeah. I was very fortunate. I had two superb managers, different points in my career, back to back at that, who gave me very, very good guidance. But it's this, um, empowerment of others, giving them the chance to make the tuna melts and make the mistakes and chisel it off your once non-stick pan, soon to be no more, you know, it's the fact that if it goes wrong your fault. Mm -hmm. If it goes right, their credit. Yeah. And if they know that, if they know that they've got your back, that you've got their back, and if they know that they're going to get the kudos and the praise for things going well, oh, move heaven and earth. Oh yeah. Same with your kids. Same yeah. Thing. So some smaller organizations, uh, might balk at the idea of leadership development or management training because of budget or time issues. Hmm. What do you say to those smaller organizations that are resistant and think people are just going to catch that's on the way? Some people do, you know, buy the book when it comes out, it might help. But some people do, some people pick it up. Some people are naturally uh, good at getting other people to somewhere that they wouldn't get in their own, which is my, my definition. In fact, many people's definition of leadership. The, yeah. the leader is somebody who gets a, a group of people to a direction or in a direction that they would not otherwise have got on their own. Yeah. And you do it using the simple tools of management. Management is a set of tools, a set of skills that you can apply in order to lead people in a direction. If you can't afford it, um, YouTube is your friend. Yeah. Go, go search, go do, but the one thing not to do is nothing. Mm. People are winging it. And there's a study that said one in three decisions are right. One in three decisions are wrong. One in three decisions didn't matter in the first place. But these are decisions. These are not typically interactions with other fellow humans. And if you are in charge, if you're the boss of me, if you are in a position of care, of responsibility for others, it is your duty, I would posit to do so to the very best of your ability. That's why the military spends so much effort and time on leadership training, management training, and organization development, because if they get it wrong, people die, just like that. 
If you're in a small business where you are moving bits of paper from one side to the other, if you get it wrong, you lose money. That's fine. Maybe people lose their jobs. That's okay. You're not going to die. We hope. But still, but still, you're not responsible for yourself. You're responsible for the hopes, the dreams, the well-being, the future, the success, the earning potential of the people around you. And that, if that doesn't drive you for personal development for their sake, I don't know what will. Mm. It seems to me also that as a leader or a manager in an organization, you're also uh, in some parts responsible for the ignorance of others, uh, which seems a little kind con- maybe mm-hmm. counterintuitive, but as a leader or manager, if you've been trained in these matters, then you, you have some responsibility to inform the uninformed because otherwise I, I feel like, uh, if they, um, I'm thinking of a, the old book, who moved my cheese. Oh, uh, level. I think I read that in the late nineties as a young manager at a retail store. I mean, I was in high school and I just ate this stuff up and it, and the, the principles that I was learning in there, I look around the other, you know, other managers in the organization, I'm like they have no idea. They had no idea what they were, what they were doing. And it was just such simple, you know, yeah. simple things. And so I, um, I, I naturally felt like what I needed to do was start to not only live these principles out in the organization, but also inform other people by how I spoke and, and sort of move, move people along, um, out of their ignorance. You set an example. I mean, I think in life as part of this journey we're on is that surely those of us who are conscious enough or should aim to live a life in such a way that we are an example mm-hmm. in so far as we can be with humility, with full understanding of our flaws and our, our, our lack of perfection in any way, shape or form. But by goodness, I'm doing my best and I want my best to be as good as I can make it so that people can look and say, that's a good idea that what he's doing there, then we should do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my goal is to try and, you know, try and unveil 21 different things you can talk about, 21 different ways you can lead yourself, lead others and lead leaders. Marriage managers is very different as well There's a few extra bonuses there. In such a way that people will say, gosh, that was easy, clever, simple. I will try that too. I've never tried adding pepper to my steak. That looks nice. Crink, crink. Gosh, it was really tasty. You should add pepper to your steak. Why? Because it's really tasty. Here's a pepper grinder. Go for it. Yeah. 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 This most recent example, and I, and I want to get your take on that, on this fur, uh, from the, in the context of authorship, Paul, but this recent example was, uh, the, uh, never split the difference, Chris Voss, Boston. I took, uh, I briefly took some of their courses and, um, he, you know, one of the things he teaches is looks like, sounds like, seems like, yeah. Right. And I, so my son, you know, comes home and every day infuriates his mother because she says, how was your day? And he says, fine, <laughs> like a typical teenager. So I, he came home one day, his mother wasn't home and I sort of watched him for a little bit and he seemed to have a bit of pep in his step. Like, you know, he was, he was having an an okay day and things were going fine. And I said, seems like you had a pretty good day. And he talked for five minutes straight about his day, told me everything that happened and I didn't have to say a word. Labeling. And it's that, it's exactly, I pulled the shower curtain right there, that little, that little tweak. In the words you say, or how you deliver them, or when you deliver them, makes all the difference. Um, but I wanted to ask, as as we're as we're bringing this in for a landing, what's this? How is this? All this knowledge that you bring to bear in the workplace and in management, what have you? What have you found useful as you've begun to assemble your book, as you begin to write this message? Like, what's What's carried over, and I imagine a lot of it, but I'd like to hear some specific straight from you. 
what's carried over from book to life? What's carried over from, from, from your experience, um, becoming and training elite, you know, elite leaders into becoming a, an author. I think it's, it's another step in trying to crystallize and simplify the, my ideas and writing it. So I start, I started off doing various coaching programs, delivering some training programs that I delivered many, many, many times to many different leadership and management teams in my career. So I've been working for corporate startups, scale ups for a long time, led hundreds of people in lots of different situations. And as I said, I had a couple of really good managers who helped me and guided me. And then delivering this and coaching people refined my thinking. And as I actually, as I worked and developed in faith, in fact, and studied that I just, dis I discerned that the simplicity of these core messages was such that they were quite hard to communicate cleanly, unless you actually work at how you would communicate, work at how you will frame them. And I think the coming out with this in, in a book form is a distillation further still of a nine week coaching and training course that I deliver to people. I'm turning two years worth of study and research and 70 plus interviews on my leadership podcast, um, and studies in the various good books. And the messages of agape, of servant readership, of, uh, pretty much every good management and leadership poem that was written more than about 50 years ago, anything less than that flat by night, not interested. Um, with great respect to the entire authorship of your, your output, of course, mm -hmm. and trying to take that and distill that yet further into a message that can be picked off the page and used, practically used and revelatory to somebody go, if somebody reads something that I've written and the response is, well, of course. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the things that you, that you mentioned there, I think the challenge in the written form is how much of your, uh, tonality and body language and proximity and, uh, context of a face-to-face -face conversation you lose. And so you have to, I think my, my assumption were I to write a book like that is I would have to become even more zealous for, uh, complete, utter clarity expressed in relatable, accessible language to, so that somebody has the tiniest, most minute chance of misunderstanding that that could possibly be that, you know, you can never fully erase that. You can never account for everybody's context as they're reading what you say, but you can do you can put a lot more effort into making yourself understood than the average person is willing to do. And <laughs> that goes right back in alignment, I would say, with what you've been talking about the entire time, which is that, uh, we just aren't most of the time, we're just not willing to do what we could do more than we have done or do, do what we're doing, but do it differently. And that's the road less traveled that makes all the difference as oh. Scott Peck said that. I don't know who it was, but it's like, what is it? The sign from it. I think most people drift through life and that's fine. If that's what you want to do, I think people, people realize that they drift when people are, when somebody's shown a mirror, coach somebody and say, you are drifting, you are aimless, you have no purpose. You would, you don't say that you let them come to their conclusion that you should have a purpose. You should be aimed full. That's bad enough if you're an individual, but if you're a manager and you're drifting, 
you're carrying a lot of people in your wake. Yeah. And they don't deserve that. They deserve more. Yeah. They deserve better. And you can do that. Really well put. And a great interview, a great expose on a fascinating topic for this episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. We've been chatting with Paul Morton, founder of the Practical Leadership Academy and author of the forthcoming book, Hidden Tradecraft of Elite Managers, unveiling second nature skills for remarkable performance. Paul, any final remarks for the good of the order? Oh, I think fundamentally it's not about you. In fact, sometimes it's not even about them, it's about theirs. Mm. It's putting the other person at the center of your universe makes all the difference in the world. Mm. And for one last detail, for those listening on the uh, audio version of our show, where should we send people if they want to learn more about you? What's the best place online to send them? I'm available on LinkedIn and at the practical academy website. Fantastic. Well, Paul, thanks so much for joining us for this episode. My name is Paul Edwards. Jason Todd is my co-host, and you've been listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and executives tell the stories that matter. We will see you next time.